just for the recording. Oh, great. Okay. So it's a microphone, right? Yes. Uh, it's in the field. It's in the field. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. This is a very good thing. Okay, I got three children, so I should be good at shouting. <laughs> okay, right, everybody, um, thank you for coming out today. Now, before we start, just to give you a little bit of my background, uh, some of you may have followed me on LinkedIn, um, but the, it's just it's just for the recording, so we still have to. But it's okay; it's quite enclosed. Right, so a bit about my background. So I got married very early at 20 and for seven years I was a stay-at-home mother from 20 to 27. Uh, but my family wasn't earning a lot of income because I was staying at home and my husband wasn't earning a lot. So one day after I gave birth to my third son, I told my husband, you know what, let's switch roles. So he quit his job as a government teacher which wasn't earning us enough to feed a breed of three people, uh, children. So I said, okay, and then he told me one day, I've quit my job. I said, great, now I have not yet figured out what I'm going to do. So he was stay-home dad for the next five years while I started a business. I started to go for job interviews, for two job interviews, because I had no degree. I was actually earning less than a teacher. So I said, forget it, I was going to start a business. So I started a business from home with no business sense, no bachelor degree. I wasn't in a corporate sector. I never entered a business meeting. So for seven years, when I was raising children at home, I do learn a couple of things here and there based on the resources I read on social media, on the Google. But when I started a business, I had a vision that it was going to be something that's going to be massive. Sometimes you realize that the first idea you found is not your permanent business idea. Sometimes you find something for you to learn so that you can apply in your next business idea which would make you better, wiser, smarter. And that's what I did. What I started from home was a very small business where I went on YouTube. I learned how to make ribbon for children accessories. And then I had my daughter to model it and I put it on Facebook. And people said, how much? I said, I don't know, $10? So they go, and people start buying from me. And I'm like, great, I buy ribbon $1, I sell $10. That's a business. That's a business. Then I realized, hey, 100 became 1,000. 1,000 dollars start to become 10,000 in three months. I thought that, okay, I, I can be an entrepreneur. And then um, department stores start calling me because when people put up the product on Facebook, the pictures get around on social media really quickly. And then, of course, buyers of department stores, they have Facebook accounts. So they track down the manufacturer. And I was in Singapore. I was still a stay-at-home mom. I was working doing this at home when the kids are asleep. So they call me, do you want to consider Metro Jaya department store, which is the fourth biggest retailer in Malaysia? I said, great, why not? So I went for the meeting. Of course, I don't know how to present myself very well. I was just hoping that maybe she's a mother, I'm a mother, she's going to understand that this means something to me. So I went to KL, did the presentation, and she said, okay, I'm going to give you three contracts out of our nine stores. See how you go from there, three months? Maybe if the sales are good, we can talk about the rest of the nine stores. Anyway, fast forward, not to prolong that story, within two years, we entered 54 department stores in nine countries and we had four full-time employees. So by then, I went from 2009 to 2011, I started to want to expand in other things. So I thought, hey, we should not put all our eggs in one basket in case the department store decided to close out on me. So I said, why don't I try to do other businesses? But then you know what you need when you do businesses, you need capital. And I don't know where to find capital. I've never been with an investment group. I've never talked to an investor. I don't know where to find an investor. So what I did actually at that time, for two years, I have been blogging about my company growth on Facebook. But what I didn't realize, there was already 25,000 readers following every stage of this mompreneur development. So in 2011, I said, well, this mompreneur wants to expand. Does anybody consider funding me? And within one week, $75,000 was pumped into my bank account by strangers. So they become my angel investors. So with that $75,000, thank you. Hello? Is it working? It's not working. <laughs> sorry. So sorry, everybody. Hello? Thank you. So anyway, so it's $75,000. After you take people money, the worry starts. Oh my God, I have to grow this money. I'm already having problem raising three children. I've got $75,000. You know, so I had to learn very quickly, go on Google, research, talk to a couple of people I know and ask them, hey, can you teach me how am I supposed to grow businesses? And I learned. In business, you realize that every opportunity is something you should seize to be better than what you were yesterday. 
the best teacher is always yourself because you can decide what you want to learn every day. You can build up case studies, Google exactly what you want to find out. And from there, that's how I learned. Anyway, so I took $75. I invest in a baking studio company, a makeup studio, a photo shoot studio, a lot of small businesses, but none was tech. In 2014, I had about 19 employees and five officers in two countries. And so that was the fourth year in business. But what happened was I wasn't very good with human resources. So I wasn't strategizing my people well enough. I wasn't a great leader because I don't know how to become a leader. So in the end, that investment went bust. Company went bankrupt. So in 2014, I went into bankruptcy. After I went to bankruptcy, liquidated a couple of assets, brought the family back from KL to Singapore, my mother was asking me, what are you going to do now? I said, same thing as I always do. I'm going to build another business. So what I did was I came up with this technology called Spendless Cosmetics. So Spendless Cosmetics, for 18 months after I endured bankruptcy, I was really a smarter business person. Come on, the only thing we learn the most is from our failures. You know what success teaches us? Complacency. It's only our failures that's going to teach us things we don't know because we're forced to learn anyway. So I was told my mother I was going to build a tech company, my first tech company. And she said, so what is it going to do? I said, it's going to create opportunities. So Spendless Cosmetic is a very special beauty technology platform. So what happened is if you are a stay-at-home mom or a student or anybody looking at monetizing your social media, your Facebook, your Instagram, your pin interest, right? Nowadays, when people build a business, they need three things. Number one, they need an e-commerce store. Number two, they need a supplier. Number three, they need to market it somewhere. This is the three basic things of anybody starting to do a business. So our technology allows anybody to have these three at once. What does it mean? So if, I, if I'm trying to pay bills next month or end of the month, I know that I have bills to pay. Now, I don't have a job. I, I can't leave home because I've got children. So what I was going to do, I'm going to sign up on SC website. I'm going to charge $30 on my card every month, automatically in two minutes. Spendless Cosmetics is going to give me an e-commerce website with 15,000 products from 400 of the world's top brands Bobbi Brown, Christian Dior, L'Oreal, Revlon, everything from mascaras, brush, lipstick, everything is yours integrated to your social media with your profile picture, your unique domain and then now you can personalize the layout, the background so we built for you a whole e-commerce platform with suppliers with logistics affairs being taken care of in 30 seconds. So now the person just needs to share the domain with their friends and family on Facebook and every time there is a transaction, the supplier pays you. So you can log on in the back account, you can log on with the password that you configured yourself, you can check status, transaction, customer details, order status, update profile picture, update your particulars, update your bank account, anything, update your PayPal. So straight away when you earn money, the system tells you, you have a hundred dollars of commission if you want to withdraw, you click one button and it's self-encashment into your PayPal. Then you work out to your bank account. That was what we developed. And that vision was with me when I built the business after bankruptcy for 18 months alone. So I sold that shares 10% to a family office who bought it in May of last year for 5 million um, evaluation. So after I sold my shares to them, of course, the fun starts from there. And then we start to develop the technology and then we thought, hey, if Singaporeans is going to enjoy this technology, why stop here? If a mother would enjoy earning income $200 extra per month, if a student can earn $500 more a month, why don't we start to globalize? Why do we stop at Singapore? There's always other people in other parts of the world who's going to need this technology to start earning income for themselves. When people become financially independent, they start to empower themselves. And then everything else around them is going to work better. So today, I'm going to teach you how to start little and globalize. If I work out how to do it. Coming from a tech company, this is quite technical. This one? This one? Yeah. Okay, so we are in 20 countries. So SCBT technology is available in Hong Kong, Cambodia, Ireland. We also target the developed countries, including US, UK, um, we're in London, Australia. We also try to penetrate and see how that's going, Africa and Namibia. So we try to go as many countries as we can. So we're going to show you how we actually scale from where we, are, where we were before into these 20 countries. 
So I've already explained to you about spellless cosmetics. So it's still uh, technically it's about the first in the world to globalize. So right now we have about uh, oh, tens of thousands of resellers on the platform, and our platform also comes in multiple languages. Now, when you want to globalize a company, right, you know the world is very big. There is no way that you alone is going to be able to fund the growth. But what we're going to teach you that when you want to start globalizing, you need to consider two things. Number one, eventually, you're going to need a VC, an investor, or a family office. So what I'm going to teach you is penetration into these countries on a small footprint so that the data that you acquire from you testing out their marketing skill, understanding the consumer behavior in these countries, all this data that you put together is going to be the key points of what your VC and family office is going to ask you the next time. So this is what we did. When we want to say that, okay, if I'm going to go to the VC and I say, okay, I'm going to go to Indonesia. Question is, have you been there? Have you lived there, Lisa? Have you know what the people want there? What kind of products do they like? Halal or non-halal? So a lot of questions are going to pop up. And the time when you want to pitch to a VC to globalize a company, say you evaluate your company to be USD 50 million, there's a lot of tough questions coming back. And you want to know that you have enough data to support what you're going to convince them with. Okay, so problem and solution. So when you penetrate into a country, this is the thing you want to look out for, the possible problems that's going to arise. The solution that you're going to create for that problem. Maybe the problem in Ireland is not the same as the problem in the US. It's not the same. So every country has its uniqueness. Developing country gives you a different set of problems. The kind of complaints you will get, the kind of feedback you will get, the kind of review people want to give. Some countries are more active in social media, so they transact more sales. Some people in Ireland live on the countryside. They might not be on social media. They might not even have Facebook. Okay, so the problem and solution you want to keep a lookout for. Next is the supply and demand. So basically, hearing what the customer feedback, you will understand the demand and how you want to make sure that the supply is there. So if people are asking for more hair care products in a certain country, because their hair is always dry because of the hot weather, you want to consider putting in more in that like inventory. Um, attraction. Attraction's got to do a lot with marketing. Obviously, when you want to execute something, you've got to sell it. An idea is nothing if it's not going to sell well. So basically, when you want to globalize in a country, different country practices different marketing strategies. About the same, but slight variation based on... You, you'll know it when you actually penetrate into this country and hear their feedback. So attraction is very important. And then the traction and the milestone. So as an investor myself, I do invest a little bit at the moment in a couple of companies from cryptocurrency, brick and mortar, e-commerce, it happens. But it's one of the things that I always look out for when I become an investor is the traction up to date. So people want to say, hey, if somebody tells you, Lisa, I got an idea, I think it's going to do well in 20 countries. So where are you now? Singapore? Okay, the traction is not that much since the past three years you've been in Singapore. You think you're going to be able to manage 20 countries? So traction is very important. Later on, we're going to discuss a little bit about how you can still develop your business in small progressions and build these milestones day to day to help you become more attractive to VCs. So how do I globalize existing business without much capital funding? When you want to run a business at some point, you need some funding, okay? And maybe you start borrowing with Boring family and friends, it happens. I swear to you, I do that too. Mom, do you have like $10,000? Because like, you think what? Okay, so uh, it happens that we do borrow some money when we start a business because the business needs some sort of funds. Okay, and because no one is going to be able to do a business just on investment on time because you need to be rewarded for your time because you need to eat, you need to live, you got to pay bills. So some small money would help you get going. So now how do you penetrate into without much capital funding? One, okay, the thing that you actually need when you enter into a business, if you look at how far our hand can stretch, it's not very far at all. One person can only reach a certain extent of circumference, but if you have strategic partners, that's another story. So if you have strategic partners, people who believe in the same vision, people who want to carry out your mission, these people will be performing as your clone in that country. So strategic partners is what you need to find in order for you to trust someone to execute your business plan in that particular geographical location. So if I do it in Singapore, I know how it's done. 
but I don't know how Malaysia does it. So I will need to find a strategic partner there who's going to try out, exercise my business uh, technology and see how it works. So if I wanted to get strategic partners, I don't want to pick some Tom, Dick and Harry. You, are you from Malaysia? Okay, you become my partner. It doesn't work like that. Okay, if you want to find a pool of partners, same thing. If, you, if your company needs to hire an HR executive, you're not going to hire the first person that walks in interview. What do you want? You want a pool of candidates. You want choices. You want people to come forward. All of them believe in the mission and you have the freedom of choice to select who you think will be able to perform the best. Okay, so you want that choice. So what I did was I built a community. I mean, that's why you see my LinkedIn profile. My LinkedIn profile is about 180,000 people reach per day. Every post is about 50,000 reach and it reaches up to 1 million views per month. But the reason why I built up such a profile on LinkedIn was because I wanted my vision of my company to get across to as many people as possible globally. So the people start responding from California, from New York, from Africa. People start responding, what is this technology about? What's going on? What's going to happen if we take this in our country? Do you think we will be able to do it? You start having all these people raising interest. That's when you have choices, because there's a lot of interest. So I built a community constantly. I was sharing my vision, how we execute it, how we develop it, what was the traction up to date, what are the milestones that we have done, how our technology is going to improve the next five steps. All these are very important so that people get as much information about your business to understand whether this, is, this could be for me, this could be a breakthrough for me. So therefore, after I built a community on LinkedIn, on platforms that I think is going to reach out to more people, these people could either be my potential investors, shareholders, strategic partners. They could also be my employees and a lot of things like that. Our company right now has an employment strength of 350 people. Our head office spreads over five countries and 350 people is spread over 23 countries. So next, we raise interest by consist consistently sharing our vision, which I just explained to you earlier, our progress and our development. If you have a great business idea, but you keep it a secret to your grave, no one's going to know. Okay? So basically, when you have a great idea, it doesn't matter. If the next three, four people around you didn't think it was great, it doesn't matter. The idea is yours. Nobody can see as clearly as you. Nobody believes in capability of yours as much as you do. You know the sense of direction you are going to take the business forward. You have that much dedication and passion to make it work no matter what. So you keep on telling people what you see. Before we were in 23 countries, we were really telling people we're going to go global. We are telling people that we are going to go global. We're still in Singapore, but we are going to go global. Okay, people say, huh? I don't understand. We are, we are going to be global. So therefore, I keep on telling people, and the more you tell people something, that's what they get in their head. Right? If you tell your child you're very smart, maybe not so smart, but the child still thinks it's smart. <laughs> but my children are homeschooled, by the way, so I'm their teacher, so they're quite smart. Huh? Okay. <laughs> so continue to achieve milestones. Another thing that entrepreneurs always give themselves is excuses. I got no money, so I'm just going to wait. Do nothing about my business progression until somebody is going to hand me money. The business world, the startup world, the entrepreneur world has got even more stringent. Nowadays, when people give money, the questions they used to ask is even tighter. Okay, you know why? Because statistics have shown that a lot of startups, probably up to 98% actually fail. So the VCs are even more careful with the money that they want to spend or invest. So therefore, that in business, you must constantly achieve milestones each day. The milestone doesn't have to be massive. It could be as little as, it could be small, but it's still, it's still a milestone, an achievement. You did something today, then you know more something today than you did yesterday. For example, if you wanted to launch your technology platform in Malaysia, you need some capital, but you're not capital, what do you do? You go on Facebook, you enter Malaysian private groups, you talk to people about an idea, I've got a couple of products, what do you think? What do you get? The Malaysians will start responding, well, I think this product is going to be good. I heard about this collagen, it's great if it's in my country. That's where you get information, data, and that's where you can plan your future growth. So milestone doesn't have to mean that it has to be something big. Of course, sometimes when we make money, we start to enhance our features. So we go, okay, activate self-encashment. Okay, activate WeChat digital wallet. 
activate this, activate that. So whenever we earn profit, we reinvest back in our technology, so our technology will get better by the time we want to sell it to the VCs. So invest your profit to develop and enhance your product each month to show progression. And this keeps the community curious to see the milestones of your company. The reasons why people follow me on LinkedIn was not really because they wanted to be a part of what I do. They wanted to be a part, to be informed of the development in what I do. So they want to say, okay, what's SE going to do now? What's SE going to do tomorrow? What's the founder going to do? Recently, we just formed a chief board. So we just made an announcement yesterday that our chief board is CEO, CTO, and COO. So, but next week onwards, we sign on our chief legal officer, our chief investment officer, chief content officer, chief development officer. So a lot of chief boards are being formed together. So it was the latest news that I shared with my business on LinkedIn. Trigger engagement. Encourage responses and contribution of ideas from the community how to make business better. Now, if you want to attract people, whether to become the strategic partners or investors or shareholders, you got to get people involved. I know it's your idea. Don't be too selfish. Because sometimes we cannot figure out everything on our own. So whenever I do something, let's say I need to select a logo, I actually put it up and do ask people in the community, what's your thoughts? What's your idea? I may not necessarily follow their feedback, but I will still ask for people's feedback. <coughs> what kind of products do you want to see? Which supplier should you contact? You know, we're looking for a list of um, you know, a halal certified products for this country. Anybody can recommend? And you will see some people responding, giving you information <coughs> you exactly need. So trigger engagement so that people don't get lost in between. You get people hyped out about your business, you want to keep the engagement going. So the attraction continues. So after that, when you have a good community who's engaged, who's giving you feedback, who's always asking about what the business is doing, now is the right time for you to find your strategic partners. So what we did was we configured a well-structured deck, all the vision that we've been sharing with people, we put it up in a proper formal deck, telling about what we're trying to develop or we've already developed and what they can look forward by being a part of our business. And then we keep the structured deck open to as many candidates and that's, that's when we interview our global partners. So when we enter into a certain country, our global partners who's already on the same page as our vision, they pay us franchising fee. So they pump that capital into our company, which is why that every time we expand, somebody is actually investing in our technology so that they can pioneer it in their country. So we technically earn every time we enter the country. So our partner will take care of all the local um, uh, employment to support the technology as the demand grows. They will also be responsible for the taxes. Our responsibility was to provide them the technology and support from the head office and they pay us licensing fee, and of course the profit is revenue sharing between the two partners. So we keep on doing that, and that's how we got into 23 countries. If you're unsure about legalities that you need to manage between country cross-border transactions, it's best to speak to a lawyer. The lawyer will be able to draft any legal agreement to make sure that none of you is doing anything um, illegal or not right. So we did that, and then we ensure support. After you sign our strategic partners, your objective is not to keep them in the structure for as long until you sell your shares, at least. So what happened when we have the partners coming on board? We have um, business owners coming on board from Philippines, from um, Ireland, from Australia. So there are three people with existing business. So they have some private equity funds, they have some profits from last year's, they got some shareholders, they invest in our technology so that they can also maximize their human resources to pioneer the technology in their country. So we support them by making sure that they have enough resources, knowledge about the technology. We keep our partners up to date about the development of the business. So they get more and more involved. They get more passionate. They follow the alignment of your direction. Then it makes it easier for you to sell the whole idea across 23 countries to a VC. So through global partners, you'll be able to set uh, food into countries because sets. But anyway, that's the only way because if you're alone, there's no way that you can enter into a country and suddenly know how to work out everything. When a business grows into a country, there's a lot of problem. Whether it was culture difference, working culture, uh, behavior, races, I mean the way the, the laws work over there, a lot of complications when you enter a country. But if you engage with a partner in the country who's done business for many years, it gets easier. So penetration through global partners, I was able to set foot into 20 countries. 
Of course, we start operation through our partners, which means we start making profits. We start learning what the marketing strategies that work and did not work. So right now, our companies has been divided into three entities, China, India and global. And each of them are evaluated at USD 50 million in the process of trade equity financing. So we're releasing some funds and our CLO is right now helping us to do two more pre-series before IPO in March 2019. So that's where we're going to go towards. And it's easy to sell the business now because we have penetrated, we have tested the technology, we've got enough data and backup to understand what kind of marketing strategies, channels of sales, what kind of employment power we need. So it's easy to present it to the... So it's easier for us to, pre to present it to the VC, uh, which is why that uh, we are busy right now with trade equity financing. So it gives us, with all the data we've accumulated since we penetrated into these countries, we get an accurate evaluation of our business and we are more happy with what we've been evaluated because as a founder, as well as according with my chief board and advisors, we can see clearer. We can see our path clearer because we've tested it. If you go to a place completely unknown with no knowledge about what's going to happen in that country, there's always a risk on the person funding you because they're not sure about how much money they potentially will lose about what you don't know. So that's what we did. When you want to globalize a country, country, always test the market, collect as much data as possible, try to partner with people you either know or people that you can find to prove to be strategic partners that can help you. People who are already business-minded as you, people who understand your vision, and people who are committed to be with you to grow that technology in that particular country. So for product-wise, it might be slightly different, but I'm just speaking for a technology perspective. Um, that's all. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you. Yes? That's a very good question. A lot of people are asking me that. Um, just how I balance. My children are now big. They're 10, 8 and 6. So it's quite, it's in their home school. So I homeschool them as well. Um, okay, so in the beginning, I realized that in business, right, the first two years of your business, when your business is smaller, you can still afford to lose something. You make a wrong decision, yeah, you lose $10, $100, $1,000, but the lesson is going to make you better equipped to make better decisions when the scale gets bigger. When you lead 10, be a team of 10, and you lead a team of 300, it's the same. Okay, what empowers people is the same. So over the first two years, I sacrificed half my motherhood, but I kept my husband at home. So, uh, I, so I, <laughs> I said, you stay home. You cannot travel. I can. You stay home. Okay, so uh, I kept him at home so that I, um, I don't worry about what's happening at home. I traveled for two years, networked extensively, tried different businesses, raised funding, things I don't know, I learned. I failed, I lose some money, I fall back five steps, but I learned. After two years, I felt that because I've given myself enough experiences and struggles, of course I still do that now, um, but those two years, as long, after I learned a lot, I learned to strategize people better. I learn to structure things better, I make better decisions, I analyze risk factors. So all these play a part in the decisions that I make today. So I, ha I can barely say I make better decisions than I did back then. Um, at the same time, after the past two years, um, obviously as a mother, you feel a sense of remorse, the fact that you might not be there on your child's birthday or Mother's Day and things like that. And I realized after that point of time, that regardless, all of us, whether we're pursuing, some, pursuing something professionally, of course, subconsciously, personal life is very important. If you're happy at home, you're generally happy at work and in life in general. So I went back to motherhood, but I tell myself to structure my time properly. So every day, priorities management is very important. So basically, look, you're not a robot. Even if there is 100 emails, don't leave your desk at some point. Do your own stuff and make you happy. So the moment that you get a bit tired, you realize you become less productive, the decisions you make are going to cause you heavier implications. So for me, there's a couple of rules that I do live by. So for example, number one, I try not to interact more than five people per day. So at the end of the day, I analyze back the conversation I have to understand the profile of the people I spoke to so that it makes me learn something about what I decided for my company that day. As well as if you have something urgent, or if you have things to do that day, you have a to-do list, you fulfill, if you see that 
you've done quite productive things out of 10 things you've done seven don't penalize yourself for the three go home spend time with family next day it's another day we are entrepreneurs you know what we do right we create things every day you think our to-do list is nothing tomorrow if it's nothing you're going to create 10 more things anyway so you will never finish to be honest because you're creators so that's what I do. I mean, if I get less productive, if I think I've done enough for the day, I mean, everybody needs me, they've got my time, I've made some decisions, I go home and I basically do the things that makes me happy. And another thing is you must always do little things that keeps you motivated. You know, it's very easy to be demotivated in this journey of entrepreneurship. The thought of just because an entrepreneur doesn't give up doesn't mean they never thought of giving up. <laughs> you might not want to raise your hand, but maybe some of you do think of suicide. It happens. Okay, because we are so passionate about what we chase, we plan so hard and for so many years we sacrifice sleep. Sometimes people look at me and say, oh, you're so successful, but people forget the five years before. The sacrifices you make with your family, the money that, you know, all your savings gone, <laughs> just on an idea with no certainty, all these things play a part in your success. So for me, that if you want to keep yourself happy, it's very important to do the things that has always been keeping you happy. You like to eat laksa for lunch? Go, eat laksa. You want to call two minutes home? Go. You want to go holiday for a, you know, a nearby country? You want to go play golf? Go. Keep on doing things that keep you happy. That doesn't mean they have to be expensive because not everything is, you don't have to go to Maldives to be happy. So you can do the little things, you can buy a shoe, go shopping, catch up with your mother, all these kind of things to keep you constantly sane. Because if you really, if you don't do that, you're going to be burned out one day. And then when you burn out, you give up, you regret it. So sometimes if people continue on, this is what I just shared the other day as well. If you are tired, don't quit. Just learn to rest. So any other questions? Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, so you had gone through a small SME startup company to now it's a very successful one. So would you share with us what would you what would be your biggest challenge and a fear in your life you have been through this the long process? Yes, that's a very good question. So all of us actually have fear. Lisa, do you mind repeating the question? Okay. okay. Can you use the mic? <laughs> oh sorry. <laughs> Um, um, I want to know is, um, you have been, got, sorry, I'm very excited to speak with you. Uh, you have been through from, uh, from a very um, startup, small startup, SME, to a very successful businesswoman. Now you expanding your business, your company, very successfully. What may you share? with us about your biggest fear and challenge as you have been through this whole process. Could be very enjoyable, could be full of challenge and frustration. Would you share with us, you know, how can you get from A to C? And then along the way, is there any lesson that we can learn from you? Thank you. When you start a business, um, be ready for heartbreaks, disappointment, failures. They're, they're inevitable. It's going to come. And there's always a fear, a fear that I was going to lose my house, a fear that I was going to lose my family, a fear that the business that I built for five years is going to be gone tomorrow. My warehouse might burn down. You don't know. Anything can happen. This fear is something that it will always be at the back of your mind, which is one of the things that I stop myself from having too much fear because fear limits your potential, is to activate a lot of safety nets. So which means things that keeps you safe. For example, if your family, I, I, for example, if your family learn on a certain, earn, uh, live on a certain amount of threshold income, you keep that safe for your family all the time. So you can risk everything else. Okay, but that is safe. So there's a lot of safety nets that you can work out. Fear is something you always have. As you grow and scale a business, there's a lot more at stake and also a lot more sacrifices that need to be made. People think, oh, when you have a human resources of 300 people, you have no problems because all you need to do is tell somebody what to do. It's not true. Okay, so there's a lot of fear that's going to come up, but fear is not supposed to be something that is going to stop you. Fear creates a pressure for you to overcome it. In this journey of entrepreneurship, I tell you there's no straight line. You're going to go around, go interns, go around bands, you end up in a dead end, you start over again. It will happen, it will keep on happening. There's no point in business. Any point that you are still progressing, you will lose this fear. 
So fear is always that you just need to learn not to let it get to you. So that's about it. Mentality is very important because how you react to it is important. Uh, uh, hi, Eric. Uh, so you said you actually share your whole development and your ideas on your LinkedIn account. So as like a tech company, there are always like copycats and competitors out there who are always trying to like you know copycat, right? So how do you like um, cope with this like problem? Or maybe like at what point did you decide okay? okay, I'm going to patent this idea and, you know, keep it safe. Okay, it's also a very good question. A successful business is 10% idea and 90% execution. You can start an e-commerce store, you can start an e-commerce store, all of you can start an e-commerce store, but not everybody's going to make one million this year. It's a very simple analogy. So when we share a vision, we share a path, we share a roadmap, we share what we see is going to happen, but we don't tell you according. There are some things that we don't tell you because in general, generic, generic community, they want to see the bigger picture. They want to see the surface to understand what you're trying to do. How you're going to execute it is another story. And even if you know how to execute it today, trust me, when the problem gets bigger, it's a different kind of execution. You still yourself. Doesn't mean that you tell them A, doesn't mean that it's going to be A. Eventually, when you execute the particular idea, it could be B or C. Of course, if it's technology or anything like that, you can patent, protect it, copyrights, if you're branding and stuff like that. But when you tell people about the vision, it's usually on the surface telling them exactly what they need to do. The details will be told to the people who actually will own shares in your business. So they will know slightly more details. Your accounting records, your investment, your future, your coding, your development team, your chief board, their profiles and things like that. So that will be kept for people who is going to make a significant difference in your company progress. People in general, tell them what you want to tell them in general, the surface, but it's clear as crystal about where you're directing the company towards. Yes, ma'am. Hi, thank you very much. Very, very, very inspiring. Thank you. Just wanted to ask you, a, you said about leadership and other skills that you find that you are missing. How do you learn them? And is it online or That's a very good question because leadership is often the problems of um, startup. You see, when a entrepreneur starts a business, they don't necessarily have run an MSC team of 50 people. Doesn't mean that we become a CEO or a founder, doesn't mean that we're professionally being a CFO or anything like that. So leadership is one of the problems that I had and I paid a very heavy price for that mistakes of leadership because that's why my company went bankrupt in 2014. Exactly because we've been spending our capital on human resource investment but not knowing how to track them, not knowing how to empower them, not knowing how to strategize and structure them. But because of that, they wasn't bringing us returns on investment that our investors' money gone down the drain and we had to file for bankruptcy after we released these people from their positions. So what I realized from there, that leadership is a very unique skill, and it differs from the way an entrepreneur thinks, the way a company works in a certain industry, and also the certain profiles of your employee. Which is why that when you engage somebody in employee, it's almost like a marriage relationship. There's a lot of things that you find resonating with that person before you hire them, more than just their bachelor degree. So when, when I, I learned this from motherhood because I got three children with three different personalities. I'm not even sure how they're siblings. Okay, but basically they're very different children. I realized that if I wanted to bring out the best in each of my child, I have to create the environment individually for them that may be different from each other. Someone likes piano, someone thinks piano is noise. So it differs from children to children. It's great if they do the same thing, but ultimately there are still some differences. So I learned that my design team my graphics design team, my developers team, my um, secretary and admin team, my business development team, they are all led very differently. So when I, you take the time as a leader, you do have to invest your time in empowering your own people. Not only you empower them consistently, but also you create an environment where they can empower themselves or their teams. So it's a skill that you can develop, I guess, based from some conversations of people who have managed businesses on a large scale. But more so sometimes what I did before was I actually made myself an intern in a couple of companies just so I have a feeling about how the leadership of the CEO run. And from there, I used those skills and alter in my way of leadership. I start to understand what do the people, what does my employees in Indonesia want in their life? What do they want to achieve out of their career? What kind of progression? 
So all these things, if a company can provide, provided they meet the milestone to take us to another level of profitability, we are open to adjusting their job scope and giving them that extra, extra income. What is it that drives them? And you realize that when you get to know your people, it was never money that drive people. It was not money. Because if they are self-empowered and they progress, and as a company together, they actually take the company towards profitability, the money reward will come anyway to them. If somebody brings you extra 100,000 revenue per year, you would want to reward them because you don't want to lose them. So that's very natural. But most people are being empowered through leadership, which means the leader is transparent, is clear, is visionary. So they know exactly, if I'm going to jump on a train with Lisa, she better know where she's taking me. So that is one of the things that I learned through leadership. So it's about personalization. Do not think that just because you have a skill of handling a business development, it's the same when you handle human resources team. It's not the same. So always take some time, look through the profiles of your people, understand where they come from, their family background a little bit, take them out for coffee, ask them a little bit about their family. The more you know about them, the more you can give them a personalized leadership. And when you do that, and you keep doing that, they will empower themselves to give you. They're not going to leave. You're going to save money in retraining, hiring, firing people, and stuff like that because the people keep. I mean, the, our human resources, every time we hire somebody, it's almost nobody quit. Okay, so, and I have, um, Indonesia is my social media team, Malaysia is my graphic design team, my content writers are in Australia, my admin and HR is in Philippines, and Singapore is the purchasing and buyers and procurement team. So all these teams are all over us in this country, they, they never leave. They've been with us since we started, and um, they've been with us and they still tell us they want to be with us, because I guess the leadership, despite the geographical distance, I make sure that I understand what their issues are on a day-to-day -day basis. Check back with your people, give compliments, keep them remunerated, keep them happy, give them, you know, if they say, my child is sick, tell them, go home while you're here. So those kind of small things are what make people want to work with you, other than money. Then they're willing to leave a job, to be with you and build this with you. You know, everybody will be proud, you know, to go like, hey, when we work for Lisa, we were just a small office in this place. Now, you know, Lisa is in maybe in, uh, in 23 countries and we're still here. And that's what every employee wants to feel, a sense of belonging. Yes. Um, can you share with us your success and challenges for um, finding uh, so many strategic partners in so many countries? Thank you. Thank you. So the challenges was always finding the perfect match. You know that sometimes you can go through a couple of relationships in life but not marry everybody you meet. So it's the same thing. So when we were going through our strategic partners, you have to know exactly what you want in a partner. You want somebody who has the same vision of you. You want somebody who is as curious as you. You want somebody maybe with a little bit more experience in technology than you. Somebody who has some, you will decide what kind of retail partner that you want to get on board. Not necessarily that they have to be equivalent caliber as you, because every one of us has knowledge and skill and experience, which may be different, but still valuable to the other person. So that is what for you to work out. Once you work out the criteria of the person you want to be on board your train, that's when you start to scrutinize the profile of the people who make their applications to you. And it's at your discretion to choose whoever you feel most comfortable. Sometimes the person may not be as qualified as you want, but their attitude for learning, their desire to want to achieve great things with you, their passion to drive this forward with you, is what's going to win you over. And it's very different. I have 23 strategic partners. They don't have the same criteria. It's very different from every country. Sometimes they have something that I want and something they didn't have. And I still take them because they have something that I want. So you want strategic partners around you, not only that you can constantly teach them, but they must be bringing something back to you. Adding value always has to be two ways. Okay, I always have this uh, question because uh, based on what you have shared, and uh, you have presence uh, in Southeast Asia is quite strong, um, which I'm also very interested in Southeast Asia, like my little North is Malaysia to the Southeast Indonesia. Uh, I like both countries, but the problem is I don't speak the language. So, if I as a Chinese and just come in, and it would be, I mean, more advantageous if I know that language, and you know, would, would that is it necessary for me to learn the language if I want to, uh, you know, get into these markets? Right. Okay. Languages is oh, language barrier. It happens. For me, okay, number one, some of the countries that we don't speak the language with, we have a very good bond with our strategic partners. They are, when you sign somebody as your partner, they are subconsciously a representative of you. 
You want them to carry your vision, right? They have to feel that they're part of you. They're you, actually, just di looking different. Okay, but they're in another country that when they speak, they speak the things that you want to say, but in their language. You want to tell people about how this company is going, they're going to do the same in that country where they are at, with even a local touch, because you're not able to do it. Strategic partner. There are some countries that maybe you would like to get in more involved. You can do consider to learn if you want to pick up a couple of languages, because I do speak a couple of languages. So some countries, like uh, I went to Basel, Indonesia class last year for several months. I did Mandarin class. Uh, I was going to learn Hindi at some point to go, because we're already in India. So I do make an effort to constantly learn and improve because when I do visit these countries and I visit the community, the resellers or our franchise partners, who our suppliers in those countries, and they speak to me, you want to know their local lingo a little bit, talk about the food that's nice to eat, or talk about their family in their local language, because that's how you actually win people. Because you realize that what's important to them is just as important to you, especially if you build a, if you build a company to serve a community. So that's my idea. Yeah. Yes? Uh, thank you for the <laughs> very amazing presentation. Just a few things. Um, what do you see uh, when you recruit people into your company, what values you really look for in a person, regardless or not if they have a degree or not? Okay, this depends on certain role of your company. There is uh, generally two kinds of categories of human resources that I will recruit. Number one, there are people who must be way more intelligent than you. They are going to be your chief board directors, your, your chief board members, you're going to be directors, you're going to board of advisors. You need people who are smarter than you, not for you to tell them what to do, but for them to tell you how to do it. If you ask me, Lisa, how do I IPO a company? I'm not really sure, but my chief legal officer, my chief investment officer, my chief officer will help me through. Because you have these people to guide you through. If you're going to learn every aspect of a business, from investment, capital, fundraising, you want to do human resources, penetration to countries, legal work, one founder cannot do everything. So if you want to recruit those people to guide you, you're going to have to hire people who are more intelligent from you. So they do need a vast experience. They do need to either come from a startup or some corporate some of our employees are not from startup background. They are corporate because you know it's like a corporate environment anyway. Now that your business is bigger, um, so it depends on what kind you want to learn and what kind of expertise they can bring forward to you, whether they have a degree or not. The second category of human resources are people who's going to execute the job. For example, if you want to hire a person in um, graphic design. It's very important, huh? your branding is the first you know, store, front line of selling things. So if you want to hire a graphic design, you know the criteria for a good graphic designer is their portfolio. Sometimes they self-learn, sometimes they go to a school, sometimes they learn from a mentor, I don't know. But at the end of it, when they submit a portfolio, that's when you can work out their capabilities. And you hire them based on their expertise in that particular field. So their criteria is not usually about what they have done in the past, but what they can do for you now. So that's also important. Sometimes business development, you teach them, okay, what was your last business? And go like, oh, last time I was selling wheelchairs. And you go like, okay, that's a different, th that's a different trade. We are not anything related to medical or wheelchairs. But they tell you what they learn and how they can apply for your business and see that. And you go like, wow, that's probably a good sales skill. I want you on board my team. People who are willing to learn is most important. Attitude to want to learn is very important. The last thing the founder wants to do is go to an office where people pull long faces and get attitude problems because we do have that last year. Okay, but basically, people you want to have people that is going to to learn with you. This is a startup. We don't grow necessarily, you know, from one million evaluation to one point two million evaluation in twelve months. Our series stage of funding can be from one million to five million to fifty million in a period of two years. So the rate where we're growing, sometimes we recruit one, suddenly the office become ten, suddenly the office become twenty five, suddenly become one hundred. So the rate of growth is fast. So you need people who are just as hungry and wanting to learn, learning a new skill. They have to be willing to take up multiple roles sometimes because this is a startup. You've got to be open to learn about diff doing different things other than one specific thing. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for